Hi everybody, my name is Kat Fleece, and I'd like to give you a short overview of the epithelial glands, especially how they are classified. The glands in our body are made up of epithelial tissue. These glands can be divided into two major groups, endocrine glands and exocrine glands. Endocrine glands are the glands that secrete hormones and hormones only. The other major feature is that they secrete these hormones typically into the blood or lymph without the help of ducts. So endocrine glands never have ducts. They can be unicellular or they can be multicellular. You probably are familiar with quite a few multicellular endocrine glands. I've listed just a few there, but you can add to that the pituitary, the ovaries, the testes, to give you some more. Not that easy yet for you probably to come up with examples of unicellular glands, but you will learn a lot more about the endocrine system in AMP2. And there you will learn that good examples of locations for unicellular endocrine glands will be the lining of the stomach, the lining of the small intestine. As a matter of fact, in many ways, all of our cells function as a type of endocrine glands, quite frankly. So the information shown here as uh, under endocrine glands is the information you really need to know for AMP1. In AMP2, you will learn a whole lot more information about endocrine glands. So for the remainder of the presentation, we are going to focus on the exocrine glands only. The exocrine glands only. They do not produce hormones. They secrete everything else, anywhere from oil to sweat to saliva to digestive juices and so on and so on. They also can be unicellular glands or they can be multicellular glands. If they are multicellular, they're going to have ducts. Remember that the endocrine glands do not have ducts. Within the unicellular glands, you have already learned of a good example, and that is the goblet cells. The goblet cells are the mucus secreting cells that you find in the, many of the columnar epithelial tissues. Particularly, we find it in simple columnar epithelial tissue lining the stomach, the small intestine, and large intestine. And we also find lots of goblet cells in between the uh, columnar cells of the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue of the trachea, just to name a few examples of locations. There are also plenty of multicellular exocrine gland examples, and once again, I have listed some examples you're pretty familiar with, sweat glands, salivary glands, the pancreas, oil glands, and many more. Notice that the pancreas is listed both under exocrine as well as endocrine glands. This is because the pancreas secretes both hormones and it secretes things that are not hormones. You may recall that the pancreas to regulate glucose levels secretes insulin as well as glucagon. But the pancreas also secretes some very, very important digestive enzymes. Enzymes that are responsible for helping us digest polysaccharides, disaccharides, um, proteins, lipids, and even uh, nucleic acids. Now, there are different ways in which we can classify the exocrine glands in addition to looking at their level of cellularity. So we can classify them according to being unicellular or multicellular. But we can also classify them based on their structural complexity and how they secrete their materials. So let's first take a look at how we can classify the epithelial glands based on their structural complexity. And so you're going to come across the terms simple versus compound and tubular versus alveolar. So here I have just sketched some simple cuboidal cells that form a duct. And then they form a little sac, almost looking like a little tube. 
So this could be either an alveolar type or an, a tubular type of multicellular exocrine gland. There's only one duct present and therefore we would call it a simple gland. So if we have one duct, we call it a simple gland. If there are more ducts, we would call it compound. I'm not going to draw an example of a compound uh, structure. We will take a look at a diagram for that in just a moment. Of course, it is the cells of the secretory unit that are going to be responsible for secreting the materials, whether it's saliva or sweat or oils or digestive juices. And all of these glands have different ways of secreting. We will look at modes of secretion in just a bit. Here we see a nice diagram summarizing how to classify the exocrine glands based on their structural complexity. And I will blow up this image in just a moment. I wanted to point out to you where I obtained this image, which um, is a great resource for all of you. It's free, it's online. It's called OpenStax College. And this particular image was on this particular page. So you can go to that page to find the rest of the chapter of the whole book that is free online. So let's blow this up. And so when we do this, we see that once again, we have um, a situation where we can see that glands might have just a single duct single duct, a single duct, single duct, single duct, and therefore they are classified as simple glands. Now the, the shape of the secretory unit can then dictate yet a more specific classification. Here the secretory unit is sac-like, so we call the glands alveolar. Here we see that the secretory unit is more tub tubular looking, and so we call it a simple tubular gland. There's also a coiled tubular, uh, which is a variation of tubular. If we have multiple ducts, then we refer to the gland as compound. So we can have compound tubular, compound compound tubulo-alveolar, meaning that some of the secretory units are sac-like, others are not. And this is a compound alveolar. So remember, there is one more way to classify the exocrine glands, and that's based on how they secrete their materials. And based on that, we see these three groups with the first two, the ones that you definitely need to know about. Let's take a look at them. One mode of secretion is called exocytosis. You may recall that exocytosis is a form of bulk transport. What happens is that the cell synthesizes products, packages them up into little vesicles, and these vesicles will then merge with the cell's membrane. When this happens, the contents of the vesicle will then leave the cell and in our glands, these contents, which are the secretions, are going to enter the lumen of the secretory unit. From the secretory unit, the secretion can then be guided down the duct to its destination. Now, merocrine glands which are glands that go through the process of exocytosis can be multicellular or unicellular. A good example of a unicellular merocrine gland is the goblet cell. I'd like for you to look up other examples of merocrine glands. A second mode of secretion is by means of cells sacrificing themselves. When cells commit suicide in the body, this is programmed suicide, we refer to it as apoptosis. Typically, we, relieve, we leave that second P silent. So apoptosis refers to the fact that cells are programmed to kill themselves, to commit suicide. This happens in many parts of the body, particularly in the superficial layer of your skin called the epidermis where you have stratified squamous epithelial tissue 
where the cells commit suicide and stuff themselves basically with lots and lots of keratin instead. So how does apoptosis relate, relate to our epithelial glands? Well, if we take a look at our figure here, then once again, we see our secretory unit right here. Let me make my pen a little bit thicker. And we see that's the secretory unit here, which looks somewhat alveolar, I presume. And then here we have our secretory unit. We have the duct lined by simple cuboidal epithelial tissue, very typical for many glands. And so in the case of these glands that go through the process of apoptosis, better called the holocrine glands, we find that the cells of the secretory unit literally commit suicide, like I said, and the little fragments that end up in the duct comprise our secretion. A very good example of a holocrine gland is the oil gland. Some glands secrete their secretions by means of pinching off the ends of their cells. So for instance, right here we see a cuboidal cell which could once again be part of the secretory unit of a gland. The apex pinches off and what was pinched off is now going to be part of the secretion. Glands that do this are called epocrine glands. There's a bit of controversy on whether or not epocrine glands are present in the human. Some people argue that the mammary glands, that is the glands in the breasts, are examples of apocrine glands, but there isn't a whole lot of agreement on that. So therefore, our two major glands that we need to keep in mind that are um, gland groups that are based on their modes of secretion are the ones I discussed earlier, and those are the merocrine glands that secrete by exocytosis, and there are plenty of examples of those, and the holocrine glands, which um, provide their secretions by sacrificing their own cells of their secretory unit, and a good example of that is the um, oil gland. So this wrap wraps up our discussion of the classification of the epithelial glands.